it's not. Shema Yisrael, Yahuvah Eloheinu, Yahuvah Echad. Baruch Shem Kevod, Malkuto, Leolam Vayet. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Vahavta et Yahovah Eloheka Bukol Vavka Uvkol Nafshuka Uvkol Meodeka Vahayu Hadevarim Haele Asher Anoki Matsavaka Hayom Alvaveka Vashinam Tam Lambaneka Badi bar tam bamba shiftika, beef tektika, uvliktika, vaderek, uk shakvika, uk komeka, uk shartam leo al yudeka, vahayu hotofo bainaneka, uk shartam al mazuza, viteka, uvisharaka. And you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, when you arise, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Vahavta literika kamoka. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. A whole bunch of bonus children today. <laughs> Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh turn his face towards you and give you peace. For the daughters, blessed are you of Yahweh, my daughter, for you have been kind and generous. Yahweh is your Elohim, and his people are your people. And may all people know of certainty that you are a virtuous daughter. And for the sons, may Yahweh make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. May you be a man after Yahweh's own heart. And may you be bold and courageous, leading everyone under your influence in the ways of Yahweh. For both, may your mouth speak with reverence, may your heart meditate with reverence, may your hands do the work Elohim has given you, may your feet hasten to follow the path that Yahweh has laid out for your life, may your entire life be fruitful, may Yahweh's full will for you be accomplished in your life. The spirit of Yahweh, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh be upon you. May the grace of Yeshua HaMashiach, the love of Elohim, and the fellowship of the Ruach HaKadosh be upon you now and forever. Amen. All right, since I didn't pick anyone to read Psalm 140, I'm going to read it this week. But this is our, our psalm with our reading plan, Psalm 140. And this is a prayer for protection against the wicked. So some we should maybe uh, keep in the back of our minds to to look up and say every once in a while ourselves 
Rescue me, O Yehovah, from, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men. Who devise evil things in their hearts, they continually stir up wars. They sharpen their tongues as serpent. Poison of a viper is under their lips. Selah. Keep me, O Yehovah, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to trip up my feet. The proud have hidden a trap for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set snares for me. Selah. I said to you, Yehovah, you are my God. Give ear, O Yehovah, to the voice of my supplications. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Yehovah, the desires of the wicked. Do not promote his evil device, that they not be exalted. Selah. As for the head of those who surround me, may the mischief of their lips cover them. May burning coals fall upon them. May they be cast into the fire, into deep pits from which they cannot rise. May a slanderer not be established in the earth. May evil hunt the violent man speedily. I know that Jehovah will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. The upright will dwell in your presence. Y'all join us for praise and worship. Let us see. 
our sovereign Lord and King. Oh, oh, oh Emmanuel. Oh, oh, oh Emmanuel. Oh, oh, oh Emmanuel. God with us. Oh, oh, oh Emmanuel. Oh, oh, oh Emmanuel. Oh, oh, oh Emmanuel. God with us. Hallelujah to the one who made his home and took our sin away. Oh, hallelujah, he has torn the veil, separated to bring us face to face. Bye. 
Father, thank you so much for this time of worship, and thank you for everyone here and your presence here with us. I pray that the Bible study would, that during the Bible study that you would speak to us, that you would deliver a message to us today that will, that will change us and that will, that will show us who you are. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen.
test, test, test. You guys like that song? I do too. One of my favorites. Hello, hello. Can you hear me, Matt? Can you hear me online? Okay. Hello? Okay. That's strange. How's everybody doing? Good. Sorry, it's warm in here. Apologize. I have one inoperable air conditioning unit. I'm going to try to get it fixed in the next couple of days. All right. Besides the fact that everybody's going to want to take a nice summer nap, <laughs> today, our theme from our reading plan, from teaching and the idea of preaching, proclaiming teaching. If I get there, I may not even get there today. I'm, I'm kind of under the weather. Might just get, you know, just enough to keep you awake. <clears throat> but today's theme, title, The Forever Throne and The Forever King. The theme I felt runs through our readings today in an interesting way in some spots. For sure. So, our Torah portion. Who read the reading? Miss Becky, you read the reading? Dan read the reading? <laughs> then Jared, you read the reading, I know, because you asked me a question this morning. Did you read it? The whole thing? Chronicles? Well, 1st, 2nd Samuel? Yeah. So, uh, what chapter are we on in Genesis? Thirty. Yeah, who said that? <laughs> you, you, got, you got the cheat sheet back there? All right, yes, we're in Genesis chapter 38. The forever throne and the forever king. But what is Genesis chapter 38 about? Yeah. We had, remember, I had to, I had to bust this one out a couple weeks ago. I had to jump way ahead because it was so important to something else we were talking about. Tamar... And Judah, who, what, what is, who is Tamar, who is Tamar? Yeah, let's put it that way. We should know who Judah is right now, right? Who is Tamar? Well, yeah. Yeah, Judah's, Judah's forever daughter-in-law, right? <laughs> uh, yes, she is Judah's daughter-in-law. So what happens in this story? Who remembers? From the last time we talked about it. What happens between Tamar and Judah? Inappropriate to talk about? It's inappropriate to talk about, right? This is where your grandmothers get that saying that I'm not going to repeat out loud. <laughs> Better in the belly of a than on the floor. Anybody ever heard that before? That horrible thing that old, old church people used to say? The reason why they get that is because in this chapter here, uh, Onan, the second son of Judah that is married to Tamar, gives his seed or spills his seed on the floor 
and God is angry with him and kills him. Because what was Onan's job? Onan's job was to replace his brother Ur er and have a child through Tamar. Tamar was married to Ur. Er. Ur er died. Why did Ur er die? Yeah, this version that I have here, it's like a retranslation by a commentator, right? He basically not only commentates, but he retranslates the literal Hebrew. He says, God saw that Ur er was bad, literally. He's a scholar. He's not being funny. He's like, that's a, that's a better version or translation of Ur. Er. Like he was, some, he was rotten. He was no good for sure. We don't know why. We don't get any clue of why. We just, hey. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was not a good guy, and God killed him. Jehovah killed him. Okay, so then we find Onan, and Onan does not continue through with uh, the consummation of his marriage, and he spills his seed on the floor, and Jehovah says again, you know, this was bad in his eyes, and he killed him too. Um, a lot of people, like I said, make a bunch of silly religious rules based off of this. I believe this is an incident. I believe this is a situation and circumstance where particularly a very protected situation and circumstance. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that, that in just a second, right? And Onan knew that, his, that the seed would not be his. This is verse 9. And it was when he came to his brother's wife and he spent on the ground so not to give seed for his brother, so not to raise a child. So he knew that the child was not going to be his. It was going to be in his brother's name. And so he did this deed. And Yehovah said it was bad, and he killed him too. Now, do we have a Torah yet in this part? We're in part one, right, of our story, Genesis chapter 38. Is there commandment from Mount Sinai to the Israelites at this point in the story with Judah? No. They haven't even, we ain't even got to Egypt yet, right? Joseph's going there. We haven't even got there yet. So, lots of people also like to suppose and argue back and forth about how much of the Torah did the Hebrews, the Israelites, the 12 tribes already have. Well, in this case, right, whether it was commandment from God, which it sounds like it would have to be if he's getting mad at the fact that Onan is being selfish here and not wanting to raise a child, a seed to his brother, and he kills him. So it's that important. Okay, so if it's that important, then no need to argue. Just think about it, meditate on it, look at it, and say to yourself, somewhere, somehow along the way, commands that we don't find written until Exodus were a part of their lives. Possibly straight from God himself instructed to, to Jacob or Isaac or Abraham. We don't know. Could have been just cultural, but it was important enough to where it made God angry, and he said what Onan did was bad by not practicing what is called the, let me see if I can say it right, the leverite, leverite marriage, in Latin, the levir, meaning brother-in-law, right? And this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. You can read about it as a command in God's instructions in the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 25. So, now Tamar still does not have a child, and she goes to Judah and says, when are you going to give me your third son? And at this point, Judah's like, girl, you bad luck. Sorry, just pull out my, my trailer park get on this there, right? Girl, you are bad luck. But he doesn't say that out loud. He's just like, hey, when he gets a little bit older, I'll give him to you. He's just not ready yet. And she's like, okay. And then the scriptures say, in most of all the versions, it says, uh, and the days were many, or many days passed, and Judah had not fulfilled his promise. And Tamar hears about Judah. Well, first of all, it's an interesting passage here where it says that Judah's wife passed away, one of his wives passed away, and he was sad. Um, and so he's going to go to the sheep shearers. Just That's what they got to do. They got to go to the sheep cut, right, because you don't get sheep cut they they end up having you know giant big old huge fur balls and and that's how you make money is with the wool why are you laughing at me dan it's funny <laughs> the farmer back there is laughing at me you got to get the sheep sheared all right so he's going to a, a particular town 
Tamar hears about it, wherever they go to go get the sheep sheared, and she takes off her widow clothes, puts on prostitute clothing, whatever that looks like, and goes and covers her face and stands by to tempt Judah. You're laughing at my, you're laughing at my, my you, you get the, you get the felt board now. There's some really other weird ones. They were so weird and they bothered me so bad. Judah was so weird looking that I just was like, no, I'm not putting that up on the screen. It's going to scare Sarah, right? Like I wasn't going to do that, right? Uh, but where her face is like veiled over, right? All these old English paintings. They're so funny. But um, he sees her and he recognizes her as a prostitute. And there's some interesting, interesting language here. So he lays with her, and the scripture says specifically that she became pregnant by him, like right away. Um, but they had this conversation beforehand. He's like, I don't have any money to pay you for this deed we're about to do. And Judah, she's like, just give me your stuff as a promise to you bringing me a goat back. He promises her a goat. Okay. And so she does, they do this exchange. They, they, they have sex. And she gets pregnant. Okay. She conceives a child. And um, she gets up and she basically takes off those clothes, puts back on her, widow, uh, her widowhood clothes. And Judah then tries to send back a goat for her. And he sends uh, his friend, uh, the Adulamite, right, to take, take back the pledge uh, from the woman's hand, and he did not find her. So he looks around and actually says an interesting thing um, I've never heard of before, I didn't ever, or never caught before in the story, even though it's a very, very significant story. He says that he can't find the sacred prostitute. And you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's something about who she was or what she was or how she was dressed that set her aside from regulars. And even here, the concept is not necessarily in the commentary. The, the, the scholars right, are not entirely sure. There's about a, a lot of guessing and stuff. But why did he call her? Why did this Adulamite call her a sacred prostitute? So he comes back to Judah and says, listen, I looked everywhere. I couldn't find her. He's like, well, oh, well, I guess she keeps my stuff. You know, maybe one day we'll run across her or she'll come to collect. Who knows? And then about three months is what the scripture says. Somebody came and told Judah, hey, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he's like, what? Who did this? I'm going to fillet them. Right? Now, he doesn't really say that, but he says he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna bring her out and let her be burned. Man, he's, he's exacting justice on this horrible woman, Tamar. And what does she do? She says a very interesting phrase, and this is also something new. As, even though I've talked about this passage a lot in the past, and I've heard a lot of teachings, this was the first time I heard this. She says something very interesting. She says, recognize to whom does these seal and cords and staff belong. Okay? And of course, Judah recognizes, says he recognized and said she's more right than I am because of the fact that I didn't give her to my son Shalah and he did not go on to know her again. So Judah's done with Tamar. He gives her to his son Shalah. She has two children. Perez, an interesting story here. Perez, breakthrough or uh, what's the word? Uh, pen, it's not penetrate. It's uh, basically pushing through is the concept and the idea he pushes his hand out and, or not pay rest, excuse me, Zara, the second child, two twins, right? Twins, excuse me, I shouldn't say two twins. He, uh, Zara sticks his hand out, they tie a red scarlet on his hand, but then Perez breaks through and he's born first. And so Zara is the second born. Just an interesting story that they put here. There might be something to that, but what's important about Perez? Very, very important piece about Perez. And that's why the story is even that much more interesting. He is the lineage of Yeshua. He is from Judah to Perez. He is in that lineage. Hmm. So, our theme, the forever throne and the forever kingdom, Here's where it's getting started. I know we can say, no, wait, it got started back at Abraham and Isaac. And No, I'm just saying, the lion of the tribe of Judah, here's where the path starts to branch off. 
where we get to eventually David, who we're also talking about. So, what's so interesting about this concept or this Hebrew phraseology? <laughs> Recognize. And then, one of the biggest scholarship questions that's asked and some people attempt to answer, other than it's just in the timeline of his life, and it's important to the future, and obviously God wanted us to see it for a particular reason. Why this story? I bet there's all kinds of scandalous stories around all the brothers while Joseph is being a slave. Why did, why did we get this one? Why, why Genesis chapter 38? And why Judah and Tamar? Um, well, of course, us Messiah-worshipping folks who believe Yeshua is our Messiah are like, it's just letting us know about the forever king. It's just the start. It's like a drop. It's like the the, 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 you know, the, the spark that's lit. And it's interesting how it's done with Tamar being more righteous than Judah, as he even proclaimed, right? By, by saying, no, no, no. I have to raise a child to uh, his father. Now, the Matthew lineage says that his father was Judah. It doesn't give Shelah or Onan or Ur the credit. But regardless, a seed had to come from Tamar, and Tamar had to have a baby. That, you know, that's what a lot of people say, and a lot of people think about this chapter. First time ever I've ever heard this with this recognized piece, and how much this might have really, truly uh, hit Judah right in the face. If you go back to chapter 37, if you go back to chapter 37, we'll start at verse 24. And they took him, and they threw him into the pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they raised their eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I went, went back too far. So this is where they, they, they basically take Joseph right, and they put him in the pit, and they're going to sell him to the Ishmaelites. And then they took Joseph's coat, I'm down to 31. And they took Joseph's coat and slaughtered a he-goat and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Recognize. Is it your son's coat or not? It's a very particular Hebrew phrase, and it's a very particular way to use that. It's, it, instead of basically being like, Hey, Dad, do you see his coat? We found this. That's you know, sad. It's more like, See, is this his coat? And Tamar says, See, is this your stuff? That's right. So it's possible with that recognized boy, that recognized piece or the identify piece, it's possible that that shook Judah to the core. Like, yeah, yeah, I see. That's my stuff. It's interesting connection to all the rest of the surrounding chapters, 37 and then 39. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, I remember last week we talked about that, right? He was, he was reluctant to have him killed. Yeah, he said, let's, let's put him in the pit and let's wait for people to come by. Reuben was reluctant for the whole ordeal. He was like, let's just beat him up. He didn't really say that. But Reuben didn't want to go through with either of any of the steps. Third, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? Four. Yeah, he's four. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what a live right. That's right. And, le, and that's a, how, what a live right marriage is about. It's basically, yep, you, you, even if you're married, you still take your, and I know this is, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you're talking about polygamy. You still will take your brother's wife and have a child for her, even if you're already married to somebody else. And she will then therefore say, this is Yosef bin so Onan, not Yosef bin, you know. Uh, it's, 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 it fits there, right, a little bit. Um, I think the Kinsman Redeemer is a little stronger of a picture, though. Well, uh, yeah, I think we're, I think the Kinsman Redeemer, yeah, that's the, that's the whole shoe thing, right, the Ruth, the Ruth thing, right, the Kinsman Redeemer, yeah, that's actually, she's right. That's not a Levite marriage. That is just a straight-up 
who is, can marry this woman, right? Who has the right to marry this woman? That's the concept. And, and even better, it's who has the rights to this woman's stuff, right? That's what we get with the story of Boaz, right? It's because yeah, that was really what it was about. She has a, no husband. Some man needs to protect her and take care of this stuff and help with this stuff. Who is that man? Who's the responsible party? And that's why it's a shame when that kinsman redeemer doesn't follow through. That's why the whole shoe piece comes into play. All right, so pretty wild as the Bible turns story, right? Everybody agree? Judah and Tamar and the start of the lineage and how this all plays out, I think, and why it's right there smack dab in the middle of the story of Joseph. Again, I believe that it's there for a reason. I can't tell you all the reasons why. Right. <laughs> I don't have all of the reasons why I can just I can just I can just guess that it's to, to demonstrate something for us, you know, in the life of Judah, particularly with this lineage. Go ahead. Gary, you want to say something? The avoiding pregnancy part? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I was not going to go there, but. Right. Own him. Second son. She marries a third. Yeah. That was, that was the that was yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, can you hear the room mic online now? You can hear me though, real well. So let me try to just for the online crowd. Jerry's saying lots of people like I like I kind of mentioned earlier, right? The old grandma saying um, that you know. A male seed should never, ever go to waste, right? Should never, ever, you know, birth control. Should never, never intentionally try to not get pregnant, right? There's all kinds of different denominations that believe that. <laughs> Jake. <don't. laughs> My grandma actually did. She actually did. So I can actually say I'm not just making this up. So anyways, um, and then Jared's, Jared's point is lots of people use that to be like, hey, not, not, you know, you can't have, uh, you cannot attempt to stop pregnancy or that you should always be trying to get pregnant. And I agree with Jared, his answer or his belief in that, in that it is uh, not the point of this story whatsoever. And it's, a, it's truly about owning, um, not doing what he was supposed to do, whether it be through uh, his father's will or whatever. God gets angry at him because in this moment, in this instant, he chose not to have a child like he was supposed to. However, that that goes down. Is that good? Good summation, so that the online people could hear what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you can. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think I think they I think. Yeah, I think uh, I think that was a problem you could say. In the in the world, maybe in the culture, I would go so far as to guess that they weren't 
as bad as maybe other cultures were. For instance, right, the fact that he was actually really willing and, you know, determined to pay the prostitute, you know. Um, the hypocrisy, right, is one thing, but then he quickly flips scripts. Again, like I said, probably because of the way she asked the question, right, recognize, identify whose stuff this is. Um, but she, you know, he quickly flips script and basically says, I'm jacked up, you know. So, so what, and I've always had this thought in my mind about this particular subject, about the respect of women in Scripture. And I, and I unfortunately haven't spent enough time and effort like I should have to, to, to nail it down truly. But I believe that the Jewish culture at times outdid most of the rest of the world, even those who worshipped women, right? They did a better job at respecting the, the matriarch, so to speak. I honestly believe that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's po possibly a good point of this story as well. She is more righteous than I, is basically what Judah's saying. She did the right thing. Again, though, I just, every time I read this story and I think about it, the thing that I just feel, you know, even, you know, with some new stuff I've learned this time is, man, and we talk about it a lot, right? What about Ruth? We're dealing with David right now. We, you know, uh, all these things. Tamar. Ruth, right, all of David's family and the craziness there, right? This was, you know, the Messiah's lineage. Um, the forever king came through a bunch of, you know, crazy people. Yeah, humans, for sure. For sure, the definition of. All right, so with that being said, we're going to leave part one. All right, we're going to leave the Torah. We're going to leave this place in the, in the forever king's lineage, and we're going to talk about another place in his lineage. Oh, it's hard to see the picture. I tried. I really did. But if you can't tell, that's King David. His back is to us. He's just getting down. He's dancing, okay? He's dancing, praising God, and that's uh, Michael and her, and her group staring out the window, seeing him, Michael being embarrassed. <laughs> so David danced with all his might is what, what the, the, the passage reads. And 2 Samuel 5 through 7 is basically a rehash of stuff we've already talked about, just a little bit more detail, like Hiram, right, attire. It, it just basically breaks down a little bit more of what he brought, right? And, and it actually mentions, you know, the stonemasons. But the same, the same event happens where David sees this king from Lebanon coming to build him a house and he realizes, oh, man, I, have, I am king, and God has glorified my kingdom for the nation of Israel. And so you get, you get some pretty you know, similar things, which is a little bit more detail. Um, let, me, let me pull out the Tanakh. And part of that similarity or same storytelling is <laughs> I can never get used to this. Like, I just, I try every time to grab it the right way, turn it the right way, and open it so I don't look like I'm silly. I can't help it. Um, another piece of the uh, repeating of the story, right, is the picture that I got up here, and that's the whole bringing the ark um, incorrectly to begin with, and Uzziah dying. We talked a lot about that last week. Um, and bringing it up correctly and dancing with the Levites carrying it, and unashamed uh, display of praise and worship by King David. Now, a lot of the commentators that I looked at, especially the, the Sunday church, you know, Christian folks, uh, they, they were real like, now look, he was just dancing with the beat and dancing with the music. It doesn't mean he was going crazy, and he wasn't in his underwear. He was wearing an ephod with linen ephod, and I'm like, Okay, fine. Take away all my fun. Right, whatever. He was dancing normally. It still says he was dancing with all his might. So, in my book, he was crumping. In case for you old folks, if you don't know what that is, I'll describe it to you later. But he was dancing with all his might. With everything he had in regular, plain, very less amount of clothing because 
he was not wearing his royal garb. He was looking like everybody else, and he was putting himself with the worshipers to worship God, to not be recognized above Yehovah, right? It's good stuff, okay? Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice this week, last week. I know I was real ugly about this whole Michael thing, okay? I chased, you know, uh, Miss Becky in, into the... Uh, uh, mud room to basically be like, ha, 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 see, don't talk that way to your husband. Um, not that I've ever heard her talk any way to her husband, but I definitely use it against my wife as well. I said, yeah, you better not despise me in your heart. But um, really, though, in all serious, besides the joking part, um, it is important to really address this issue because I have throughout my life, you know, especially in different church circles, even, in, even inside of the Hebrew Roots movement, I've seen a lot of um, situations where, you know, a man is doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, or a woman, you could, you could flip this either way, right? And then they get, they get judged by their significant other in, in, a, in, a, in a wrong and an ugly way, and it creates all kinds of problems, like division and stuff like that, and it's not, it's not good. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see. Yeah, so David returned. This is verse 20 of chapter 6. David returned to bless his household. Michael, daughter of Saul, went out to meet David and said, How honored was the king of Israel today, who was exposed in the presence of his servants, maidservants, as one of the boars would be exposed. And David answered Michal, In the presence of Jehovah, who chose me over your father. <laughs> Boom. Like, that's, that's a way to fight. Um, <laughs> man, I think right there, that would be where Brandy would just walk away. Um <laughs> over his entire house to appoint me as ruler over the people of Jehovah, over Israel. Before Jehovah, I shall rejoice. And I shall behave even more humbly than this, and I shall be lowly in my eyes. And among the maidservants of whom you spoke, among them will I be honored. So he even brings back up the... <laughs> I know you were over there. Um, and it's funny, not only does it bring up Saul, then he says, and yet, in those maidservants, they will honor me too. Not quite sure what he means by that. Not sure if they, he's trying to talk about his one day soon to be harem that he creates. I hope not, because that was not nice, David, and you should definitely not have said that. Um, Among them I will be honored, he says. And then it says, the, verse 23, Michael, daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. So she was barren from that point on. Um, yeah. So not despising your husband or your wife and making sure that your, your viewpoint or perspective is not about the fancy royal things of this world, and it's about truly Jehovah and his, his glory. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, so probably true in itself if you think yeah, about it yeah. because David obviously has just, you know, told her off and right. was correct. She was wrong. Um, I want to say, what are you saying, Jared? might be trying to tell you when she did have children. Yep. Okay, it's fine. First Samuel what, Jared? Yeah. So the so the the commentary here is 
some some say it's because it is a punishment that God did it. Some say that uh, she just wasn't able to have any children past this point. And some even translate it as it means that she died in childbirth, which I don't know where they where the rabbis get that from. But um, and some versions right say she was made barren. Does anybody have like the King James version out right now? You got it. I think I have it actually. Chris says she had no children. Yeah. I did have it pulled up. I think it's behind my PowerPoint. That's King James. Yeah, it's what it says in the Tanakh, exactly almost. Yeah, so we don't really know. Um, it could be just an outcome of their relationship. It could be God did it. It could be, yeah, we don't know. Um, I will say this, though. Like, even like last week's passage uh, basically made it sound like, hold on, what was uh, Chronicles 16? Yeah. Basically, it made it sound like she definitely was in the wrong. Is that 1529, Jared? Yeah. Yep. It happened as the Ark of, yeah, so here's 29. It happened as the Ark of Jehovah arrived at the city of David. Michael, daughter of Saul, peered out the window and saw King dancing, uh, the King David dancing and convorting before Jehovah. And she became contemptuous of him in her heart. So even then, it doesn't really say one way or the other. It just says she became contemptuous. I would definitely say she's wrong. But, but yeah, no matter what. But for a while, it was that she punished. I'm not sure. And again, like you said, it goes to the prophetic uh, concept or idea that Saul's, you know, lineage, right? Um, yeah. So... Dave, dancing David, causing all kinds of trouble, getting his wife upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. She was, she was given to as a as a, I guess a punishment or a slap in the face of David. Yeah, why why did he why did he why did he say, you know, come back? Um I mean maybe they really did have a she was his first wife too. Yeah, crying behind her. Yeah, that's right. I remember us talking about that. I remember I, I remember me remember me saying I, I might cry but I ain't gonna follow you behind you. <laughs> um where's my wife at? Where's she at? No, oh, she's she went back over the kid with the kids? Okay. Good, safe. I can say whatever I want. No. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the question is, you know, for the online audience, why did he even ask for her back? Um, and uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, yeah, not so much a question, but a statement about remember Michael's wife was uh, – Followed by her ex-husband crying as she came, had, was when David did demand her back, he was that upset about it. So she's an interesting character. It's uh, it's an interesting thing to think about all the steps. David's first wife, Saul takes her and gives her to somebody else. She comes back. Dude is following her crying, um, really upset that he you know no, doesn't have his wife anymore because King David demands her back, right? And then King David. In this this incident, dancing with all his might before the Lord as a plain person, um, as a beggar, is kind of the idea and the concept of what she says. 
and uh, he says, you know, I'll do this even more humbly, right? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, he was like, don't make me get naked. I, I'm telling you, that's what I'm thinking he was saying. But, you know, maybe, maybe not. But he does say, I was definitely going to, I could be even more humble, more, more, more crazy, and, uh, and more, more not kingly, is what he's saying. Okay, so in the theme, of course, of the forever throne and the forever kingdom, we, we have 2 Samuel 7, right? And notice how we got four chapters this week because we go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And basically what these two are, are that they are the exchange between Nathan the prophet to King David as David says, hey, I want to build you a house. Now, this isn't where we get the whole your hands, you're too bloody yet. We're not there yet. This is the first time David says, I want to, how, do, how is it that I live in a, in a big man, you know, mansion, huge you know, kingdom, and you, you know, God, uh, the God of Israel, doesn't, does not have, do not have a place to dwell with made of wood and stone. And Yehovah basically says to him in both places, he says, listen, don't, don't worry about, I've never asked, why, why, why does that matter? I've never, in all the years I've been with Israel, and I've never demanded from any judge or any prophet to have a house made of wood or stone. Don't, don't worry about that. He says, but do hear me when I say this, that your son will have, will have a kingdom that is a kingdom, and basically I'm sum, su- summarizing, it gets down to the point to where it'll, he'll be a son, like a son to me. Um, I will punish him and discipline when he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And then it says, and his throne and his kingdom will be forever. And if you read these two chapters, I'm not going to read them for you, but 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, they are obvious pictures, um, and I'm pretty sure even the rabbis agree that these are obvious pictures of that Messiah that we're, we're all looking for to come back, um, for sure, for us, but the Messiah who we all recognize is the king forever, and his throne is forever. All right, that's it for part two. God, excuse me, I'm not feeling so so well today, trying to trying to have that energy and passion to keep us all, all us warm people from taking a nap, because like I've told y'all before, as much as I enjoy this and I'm getting something from it and I feel great and encouraged, um, I am sleepy. <laughs> and it is warm. All right, so we have an interesting reading in the book of Acts today. It's kind of like not, not a whole lot to it. Acts chapter 23, verse 23 through chapter 25, verse 22. We have uh, Shaul, right? He's basically, we left him last week saying, look, you can't do this to me. I'm a Roman citizen. And um, the, the commanding officer got scared. Remember what I talked about? I kind of stole my thunder and I said there would be uh, in verse 23, he, the commanding officer said, prepare 200 soldiers as well as 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. So 470 men just to protect Paul, the Roman citizen, because he was not going to allow the death pact uh, conspiracy to kill Saul. So those dudes are just going to go hungry because I'm pretty sure they're not going to take on 470 men. And they don't. Saul gets to where he's supposed to go uh, safely. And he gets there, and again, in front of the governor this time, so not just a commanding officer, but the governor, Governor Felix, uh, he has to defend himself before the pieces and parts of the Sanhedrin, and specifically the high priest. They basically hire, or they bring in their best, most eloquent order, Tertullus, to accuse Shaul before the governor. Um, and they say all these things about him. They say he's, you know, he's a rebel rouser. He's getting all these people angry and mad and, you know, getting them all spun up. And basically, Shaul answers with, no, I'm just worshiping. The only thing that they find fault in me is, is that I have a hope for the future and that I believe in the resurrection of the dead, right? So he's still playing that Pharisee, uh, Sadducee card, right? He's still using that against them, getting them riled up a little bit. And they continue to accuse him. 
And, when, and this is verse 22. When Felix, having an accurate understanding of the way. So Felix is already, the governor has already uh, gotten word and understands there's a group of people that are considered followers of the way. And that they are people of Yeshua. Okay? They believe in him. And I'm sure by this point, right, remember, Shaul's making, I mean, you think about, we've, we've read Corinthians, right? Um, we've read, uh, I think, have we read Ephesians yet? We haven't read Ephesians yet. We've read a couple of the epistles, right? And this is, you know, Paul sitting in a prison cell writing them. We've read a couple of the letters that talk about his journeys and who he's been with. He's making, he's making waves in the Gentile world as well, for sure. So the Romans are paying attention, right? I think it's one of the accurate things that a lot of the Christian movies out there have, including the current popular thing chosen, is they show how the Romans are like not about this whole Messiah piece and this guy healing people and what are you talking about, miracles, and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're always curious. And so Felix, he's having an accurate understanding of the way, heard these things. He, def- um, he deferred saying, when Lysias, the commanding officer, comes down, I will decide this matter. So Felix commanded a centurion to guard Shaul, but allow him liberty. So now he's got a whole entire Roman centurion, right? Basically, that's a large group of, I forget, what the, what the is it 100? Yeah, comparison in the army would be like two battalions or something like that, or a battalion, which is made up of some, I can't remember. Sorry, my, my bad for my, my military history. But, um, and none of Shaul's, here's another key piece. We read this in some of the epistles, and we're going to read it in the next couple of days. None of his friends were prohibited from visiting him. So not only is he got freedom, and he's guarded and protected, and he's writing down really important words to the churches while he's being, you know, hanging out and waiting, but he has the ability for all of his friends to come see him. None of the bad guys, all the good guys. Uh, sounds like a God set up to me. God is definitely a part of this whole ordeal. And after certain days, here's a really interesting piece. After certain days, Felix returned with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. And he sent for Shaul to hear him concerning faith in Messiah. And Shaul spoke about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered, go your way for now. I will call for you when it is more convenient. <laughs> Everybody hear that? That's important. It's probably the most important part of the piece today, of the reading today. Most applicable piece of the reading. Don't just be listening to the word of God when it's convenient for you. <laughs> now, Felix sent for him often, though. It says, very next passage. He sent for him often. Uh, so sometimes it's hard for us to hear what's coming and to hear the word of God. And I can, I can, I can relate to Felix. There's a point where I'm like, Whoo, this is a little much. When I even when I sit and meditate and pray and think about the future and the the righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Um so Felix, Felix sent for him often, but after two years he gets replaced by Festus. Um and Festus takes over this position, and so he keeps Shaul bound or lo- like not able to leave as a as a favor to the Jews, is basically how it reads. He 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 garners favor as he moves on and probably up in his, you know, position. And so then we get Festus, and Festus, um, again, he, he wants to hear all this um, from Shaul and hear what's going on and why are they all upset. And he's, um, it says in verse 9 of 25, it says, But Festus, willing to do, uh, willing to do the Yehudim a pleasure, answered Shaul and said, Will you go up to Jerusalem and be judged there concerning these things before before me? So he's ask, actually asking because in this case of him being a Roman citizen, he has the ability to choose which way he goes. He you know he can say no, I'm a I'm a Roman citizen like he did already and got protected, or he can he can agree to go back to Jerusalem, which he would be absolutely stupid for doing, and he knows better. And so he looks at Festus, and at this point he's like, all right, if you're going to keep on playing, you guys are going to keep on playing games. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus was like, whoa, really? Because um, that's a big deal. You got to think about it. It's not, like he, it's not like he's, you know, doing himself a favor. I know a lot of people may think that way, but no. All the Caesars at this point are starting to get more and more messed up in the head, more and more lovers of themselves, so to speak, and believing that they're gods, right? And they're getting crazier and crazier. And Shaul is basically saying, 
I appeal to the devil himself. Let's go. Right? So, hey, brave on Paul, but not so much the shining, you know, cool thing that some might think it is. Because it ain't. So, at this point, we leave this portion this week, you know, just a kind of to be continued because the next thing that's about to happen is Festus is like, all right, I can't send you there yet. You're going to wait here. You're going to chill out. But I am going to have King Agrippa talk to you. So we're going to talk about King Agrippa, and we're going we're to listen. As an example, we're going to listen to Shaul's words to King Agrippa. And King Agrippa, and it's funny what he says, and I'll explain why it's funny next week, but you know, he basically is like, Hush, hush your mouth. You're about to convince me, right? So let's be like Shaul, and let's convince even the unconvincible of the right way and the right answer, obviously with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, like we've been talking about over the past couple weeks, especially if you're listening to or, excuse me, reading my band post and following along and meditating on those verses. They're good stuff. None of my children have. Avery, don't act like you have. <laughs> you read them, but you don't read the Bible is what you're telling me? <laughs> mm, good job, Avery. Um, <laughs> okay, so we'll talk about King Agrippa next week and what Paul has to say. Um, that's it, guys. What time is it? Boy, man, I'm, I don't. Man, the second week in a row. Goodness, got anything else, Jared? I feel like we got to fill, we got to fill this time up. Um, if you do, you got to come get a microphone because the, the room mic and our sound is not doing so hot. No, that's fine. Um, I'm ready to to pray. You ready, Jared? I will say this uh, with the band post and where we're at in the Book of Acts and talking about Shavuot and um, the Holy Spirit. Uh, just. I just really, this is the first year, I wouldn't say the first year, but it's definitely the best year I've had as far as his personal anticipation for or using Shavuot and the counting as a personal, like, measure, measure of how I should, remember I've told you guys before, and I told you I was preaching to myself, but that we should anticipate, we should anticipate encounters with with. The, the spirit of God, which anticipate the ability to pray for somebody who's sick, to to minister to someone, to like I just said, convince somebody that's the unconvincible, right? That the Holy Spirit would operate through us, and the gifts of the Spirit could operate through us. There should be an anticipation for that kind of thing. And Shavuot is really, um, I believe, I'm starting to believe this year really is an anticipation piece, like. If I can carry that spirit of Shavuot with me, the counting of the Omer, and I'm not saying I need to count the Omer every day, and I'm not counting the you know, 50 days every, every 50 days, right? If I can carry that attitude, that mindset, and that anticipation for what the apostles received and how the people received and how they walked that out from that point on, maybe I can get myself more prepared and anticipating the Holy Spirit operating in my life through me for others whether it be my family, whether it be you guys, or just be a stranger on the street, right? So use, use, those, use those band things and use this, this time period and these next couple of days especially as just that, that, that reminder of I should be always anticipating being used by the Father, right? All right, so I'll, with that I'll pray. Ready? Father, we just thank you again for the ability to gather together and worship you. Um, we thank you for your Shabbat. We thank you for uh, giving us this day um, to rest and to, to focus all of our uh, energy and effort on you. Um, just, again, ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us throughout the rest of this week, uh, fill us with anticipation, have us looking and, and, and learning and understanding what it is we are to do, even on a daily basis as we go, to fulfill your will um, and to expand the kingdom of heaven um, here on earth 
and to save the lost and to heal the sick and to to mend the brokenhearted um, and all that you would have us do uh, to reach um, your people um, and to reveal uh, the Messiah, Yeshua, to, to the world. Um, pray for uh, healing um, and health to myself and for everyone else in this room that we would be able to uh, fulfill um, anything that you would have for us, uh, the wisdom and understanding to stay healthy and remain healthy, um, and that we just, again, we thank you for that wisdom and that understanding um, that you, you, you've you shown us and revealed to us, uh, and, 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 and in, even in your commandments and in your Torah uh, that, that help us on how we... Um, take our steps day by day, um, just continue to write those things on our hearts, uh, continue to minister to the young people and show them, um, show them that they too can, can depend on and anticipate the Holy Spirit to guide them in all things, to teach them all truth. And we thank you for this and we thank you for that promise. We thank you for, uh, all that you've done for us, uh, especially through your son, Yeshua, the, our forever king. And in his name we pray. Amen. Did it work? Nope, I'm on the wrong string. Test it. Yes. Test it. <laughs> there we go. Rekikya Yahova Veishmereka Yair Yahova Panavaleka Vikuneka Yesa Yahova Panavaleka Yer Yashimleka Shalom. May Yahova bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. Baruch Kabah B'Sham Adonai, even so, come quickly, Yeshua HaMashiach. Shabbat Shalom.